And are you going Am to I? time yourself or do Yes, I have a timer here, private timer. Okay, great. You, you so can I'll never give him <laughs> a time. Okay. You can never be secure because there is this guy with those big pieces of paper and it just jumps on you. So, hi. Ah, I see who drank all the coffee. Um, hi, so my name is Jakub, as I was introduced. Uh, I am Polish. I am based also in Poland, which is here. And we are here. And what I really like the most about uh, getting in invited to your event is the fact that I am so much out of my comfort zone here because we have different background, different history, different culture, and it's always a very enriching experience for me to go to a place which is so different than what I am used to. But what connects us, actually, is the topic of this event. And if you are thinking, why is this strange guy from Poland talking to you today, there are two reasons for this, at least I hope. The first one is that until 2016, since 2010, I was actually very much into open data and civic tech, working for ePaspa Foundation. And through, through this organization, we managed to establish Code for Poland. We managed to do Transparency, which is a network of transparency organizations. We also did Personal Democracy Forum Central Eastern Europe and Open Cities program developing open data policies for cities and helping them actually to release a lot of data. But at the end of 2016, I decided that you know, um, I always wanted to be a journalist. I actually graduated journalism, and it's, I was very close to what I want to do, but not exactly there. So it was also a time where, you know, the world started to go really crazy, and uh, it was also a good time for journalism, uh, especially in your organization. So I decided to create an organization called Outriders, which currently, as was said, tries to think how can and report on global stories which have local impact. And we do a couple of things in Outriders. First and foremost, we do a membership-driven service uh, which where we publish stories regularly called Outrider.rs. Everything, almost everything, has uh, Outriders in the name, just to make you more confused. Uh, we also do Outriders Network where we help a lot of journalists to enhance their skills, work uh, in a new paradigm. We also do two more things. One is in Polish, it's about connecting explorers to, with reporters, and the last is we help other organizations to develop their own information projects. So those are the four things which we do as organizations. Those, especially the first one, is, um, is something which we started, uh -oh. you see, I oh know that's good, private timer works, okay. So uh, we started, uh, we were seeded through a crowdfunding campaign which was supported by 637 people which uh, I just love this number because uh, that, that was 40 days of a nightmare. If you have ever done a crowdfunding campaign, uh, it's super cool when you collect all the money, but every day just keep refreshing that page and you're like, pay, pay, pay. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so but when I was making the switch from civic tech into journalism, everybody was like, bye bye. And I was like, why? Well, you're going to a different community. I said like, no, for me it's all the same. I'm just, I'll, I'll, I'll be still informing people, just using different tools for it. But that really got me thinking that those two communities are very much apart. So I started to think, and that brings me to the topic of this, uh, is basically how, how <coughs> civic activism is actually affecting journalism these days. So we have, let's say, those are two different communities. And many would, would probably say, that those are two different communities. Now, in order to actually bridge those two communities, we need a bridge. Uh, is it on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> there I, ha I have no, uh, uh, like I don't see what's behind me. And I'm really not trying to look back, but uh, I know I already made one mistake, but we haven't noticed it. Um, <laughs> but let's go on. Um, okay, um, so, so we need a bridge basically, and the bridge is something which allows us to find common things and uh, um, and uh, allows us to communicate. So even if you're different, as I said in the beginning, there are so many things which differentiate us, yet here we are talking to each other about the same thing. So when we think especially about mainstream media, uh, and I'm not talking about some of the good examples which we have, I'm talking about average mainstream media uh, in, in countries, we see very little room for actually public service. Journalism is something which is just very expensive, and it's better, it looks better if we just start to take it out. Now, unfortunately, this is something what we are discovering since we started our traders, journalism is very expensive. Um, there is 
there's very little room for um, invest in proper, proper investigations, and so on, and so on, and so on. And actually, th th then I reminded myself that whenever we, when I was doing Open Data and Civic Tech, wanted actually to make a, we wanted the other media outlets to write about us, we wanted the traffic, we wanted the reach, and that wasn't working well. There was no, no true collaboration. There was little understanding and we actually started to see that many civic tech organizations, they would never call themselves journalistic organizations, yet they were actually acting as journalists, being either watchdogs, providing information, and so on and so on. So they were doing that society function, which technically other publishers were supposed to do, yet they were abandoning it. And I asked some of the people, like, who, how do we define yourself? No, we are activists, but you are actually doing a journalistic job. I'm like, ah, oh, maybe. Okay, so... Now, but what we see under this massive, whatever, we can complain a lot about big publishers and so on, we see uh, a lot of new organizations, especially in last, let's say, from 2014 being formed. This is a list which was just, like, I don't know, maybe two, three weeks ago released by European Journalism Center. It's 74 organizations based in Europe who are community, very much community-oriented, and we call this engaged journalism. And this is another list by the Membership Puzzle Project, which is NYU collaboration with uh, Dutch The Correspondent. And there is 106 media organizations who are membership driven. And this is a global list. So, and those are like organizations who really fight for the community. Really fight for the community. Now, and what's interesting about those new organizations? They actually have a civic goal in mind. They use technology to deliver stories and reach the audience, and they don't care that much about traffic, they care a lot about impact. Now, does this sound familiar to you? Is this how you would naturally describe a journalistic organization? Yes, no, come on, coffee people. <laughs> okay, so you see, this is more of a description of a civic tech organization. So this is why I actually, going back to this thought, I thought, no, I'm, go I'm actually doing the same thing. I just changed, basically, you know, um, change the tool. So let's, let's go into uh, this engaged journalism and actually how do you, wh what does it mean in detail? Wh what are some tactics which can be used? So first, as I said, those are community-oriented organizations. Now, what does it mean, you know, to have a community? There are probably some community builders here and so on and, and so on. Those media organizations that treat themselves as part of the community, they act as community leaders, but very importantly, they listen to the people. And there are some great successes. I already mentioned the, the correspondent, that, that platform. I think they are up right now on, they cross 60,000 members who pay them at least six euros um, a month. And they're actually starting expansion to US, um, which is coming, I think, later, later this year. But it's not only about just, you know, that people pay you and your business model is just that you're dependent not on advertisers or grant money, but on people. It's actually listening to your community. Now, this is a Swedish newspaper which started a Facebook group where they listen to people's issues with daily transportation. So now imagine this, you know, one of the biggest successes of open data movement is actually that is all the transportation apps. You know, that we don't watch anymore at the bus stop looking for a timetable. We just open our phone and we see that runs on public data. Now, we could have merged this into those apps. So that would be a very powerful collaboration between actually Civic Tech Hub and journalism outlet. And this is where they listen. How many people they have here? Uh, 1,600 people. And this is like, I have no idea how to spell that in Swedish, but that's fine. Uh, I think Chinese would be much different, uh, much easier for me. Um, but this is like, so there is a citizen who enters a bus the morning and it doesn't work the line. So they go there and they, sub they, they submit a story and then your newsroom can react, reply to them and so on and so on. You may, f I don't know, it's not silly, it's very powerful because this is how you basically establish trust and build a relationship with your group. Now, I was introduced here that I will blow your mind with interactive forums and so on and so on. Thank you for this. But frankly, what we have discovered, what works best for building a relationship with people is meeting them in person. And this is something what we are actually doing a lot. Here you have a, 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 a photo from, an, we have a migration exhibition. 
which connects different pictures from various migration crises and so on. There are also items, I'm not sure if you can see it, those are items taken from uh, left by asylum seekers on Greek beaches. Uh, and it's all meshed up, so you can go, you can touch it. But the most powerful thing is people come and talk to us and they ask questions. And people who I know have opposing views on refugees and migration, they come and talk to us. And if you think it's actually a term which I re recently heard, it's called performance journalism. So journalists going to people and telling them stories as a new way, basically. So it's not just writing, making videos and so on. It's like me, let's say, if I would be telling you a story. And after this, you can interact. And look, there is almost, what, 150 people here? If I manage to convince five of you after, uh, after a presentation to give us $3 a month, that's actually also a scalable, mo that's actually a scalable model. I can do 200 presentations, a presentation a day, and I will get, hopefully, a lot of people to, to, uh, to join us. So this is community. Now, I talked about migration, and it's a very good example because in, in Poland, in Europe, it's a highly polarizing topic. And, uh, and there's many, you know, we have this high polarization of media which basically tells people what to do. Uh, or, or like, no, we have to be against migration, no, we have to take in the refugees. Now, a key, I think, factor is inclusiveness mm, in all of this. So it's like we respect the other person. Now, I'm really trying not to sound, you know, like some coach here, but sorry for this. Uh, but this is probably the most important slide which you're about to see, and it's very simple in form. So here we go. Because this is what happened to us six months ago. So we have community and we have decision makers. All the politicians, blah, 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 and so on. And what happens is that decision makers usually, especially around election time and so on, they say something. Let's say they say, we will build a new stadium. You know, they make a promise. And what do, what, do, what do media usually do? They just write it, you know. Uh, Marcel, running for uh, mayor of Budapest, promised everybody a new stadium. So what, you know? So we are still on this side. And all the cycle, the, the, the decision makers say something, it is covered. Where is the pressure? This is a huge wall between actually community, which is not heard. Because community has problems, fears, and needs. And this is how we started to shape our editorial policy. We started to ask people, what are your problems? What are you afraid of? And what, what do you think you need? Especially the fear is very important. Because, for example, Poland has taken zero refugees according to EU quota, yet there is a huge fear of migrants. How come? This is something, but the fear is not, this is not a personal timer, this is just 8.30 a.m. in Poland. Uh, <laughs> my last clock, just the last, last uh, yeah, that usually saves me in the morning. Uh, so this is really important. This is how we try to match our stories. Usually traditional model, here comes a journalist and say, like, I'm a great journalist, here is my story, I'm ready to receive your... Uh, I don't know, kudos, you know? I'm ready to be uh, famous and so on. Now, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, we have to really go, there was some, some talk yesterday about problem solving and so on. This is how we try to adapt it, basically, to what we do as journalists. And that opens up to really like, for example, thinking about tar tar target group. We think, you know, the simple marketing way of target groups is age, education, blah, 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 blah. If I ask who is, let's say, afraid of uh, air pollution, I will get totally different people, but this will be their connector. So this is something what we started to think about six months ago, and we have just started to ro roll it out a week ago, where we trained our team, we started to develop tools. For unfortunately, there is no innovative tool to gather people's problem needs and fears. You gotta talk to them. Uh, that's how it works, you know, through do, do different town hall meetings, uh, reach out to them with uh, Facebook Lives, you know, video streams and so on. There are different tools, but you have to talk to them. We also have a, uh, we also have a research, uh, um, we also commissioned the research through which we, st we, s we ask ourselves how to, we ask those researchers to go to some uh, different people and start to talk to them about this. So if you really want to have community in your heart, you need to really 
here the problems are. So now openness. This is this inclusiveness leads us to openness. And we have to, like this is actually an example here from Singapore, new narrative. Um, uh, so one thing is that all of what also those engaged knowledge organizations have in common, they are like very much open about their finances. They really explain, for example here, yeah, oh, to fund our stories. They, I think they need like $450 per story. Hold on. Oh, this is so small here. Oh, okay. So, but there is a journalist, uh, I think it's editor and a translation. And that, oh yes, US, for, US 450, this is how much they need for a story. Now this is a very important information, also to give it to your community, how much does it exactly cost? This is also what they say here, is like where we want to go, so their vision is visible. Uh, how they spend their funds, and this is how much they need to be actually more or less sustainable. And if you see, 2,200 people is not much. Now look how, how, how is it different if I say you, I need a million dollars versus I need 5,000 people to support me every month. Those are two different messages. Actually the 5,000 sounds so much like it's doable. It's like, God, if we cannot convince 5,000 people in two years then we really must suck, you know? Uh, so this is one thing. The other thing is openness. It's like usually, you know, you just publish a story. We try to bring in people to every aspect of story production to research, uh, to um, design, we ask them to test things, we ask them to, uh, especially before release, the mobile version, and so on and so on. It's really important that from the idea to actually distribution, in the, on the last slide we haven't seen distribution, because if we have them from the idea moment, they are very much eager to distribute the story together with us because they are very much invested in it. And by invested, I don't mean that they've invested financially to it, I mean that they've spent some time trying to help us actually work on the story. And this is really important because then you can actually, they see your thought process. This is also how you build trust. They can see f how many NGOs did you talk to take, a quote, to take a quote. It's totally different and you bring them in. It's not about like them telling us, do this. This is the more sophisticated, especially on the idea level process where we get those stories, but then as we go with them, we go with them. Last two things, value. So I told you that we did crowdfunding campaign. Uh, the first description of the crowdfunding campaign, which I wrote, had five pages. And I gave it to a, a, a friend of mine, like many friends, but especially, especially this one guy who is a salesperson. And he came back to me with 15 pages of comments. And he said like, Jakub, I read this and it's all about you. I don't see any value in what you're trying to give me. And I'm like, why? You know, this is good journalism. This is going to be good journalism, you know? Yeah, so what? And that is another thing which is very important. So like, think what kind of a value do you give to your community? It's not about that I'm so cool and you're so cool. It's about if we ask people, especially to commit financially, we have to understand, first of all, ourselves, what is the value we give? And the second is they have to understand it. So we started Outriders by telling, we will be your foreign correspondents. You know, we will operate from many countries and so on and so on. And people were like, yeah, like, why do we need news from Taiwan? I'm like, oh, because you need to. You know, you, you, you have to, you have to follow the uh, global um, news and so on. Yeah. So then we started to think, okay, maybe the whole concept is wrong. Maybe it's uh, about framing it differently. So we started would you like to know about, you know, Poland has huge issues with water supplies and with na natural water, it's going down. We actually have less of it than Egypt does. And, and we were like, would you like to know about it, how people deal with it, and so on and so on. The other thing was that air pollution became a huge, uh, huge thing in Poland uh, since last two years. Would you like to know about air pollution, how people, let's say, in Taiwan deal with it, and then we can combine it with, others, with other countries and so on. They're like, yeah, that's what we want. That is problem solving. We do the same, we just explain it differently and then we adapt the process to it. So what we do is actually we merge all those different perspectives into stories. This is a story which was released by ASCAP, like, I don't know, some time ago about <sighs> conflicts which are generated by water sources. Um, yeah, and this is how the interactive comes in and so on, which allows us to re actually reach more people and so on. And we, yeah, and that actually got a lot of people talking, thinking about it, and so on and so on.
Okay, so you know, journalism is supposed to like uh, make society stronger. Now, I want to give you two examples. Now, what happens if I tell you, let's say you imagine you read an article and I tell you that 80% of female workers at restaurants in US says they have been under some form of sexual harassment. And I tell you that 49% of male staff also have been under. How do you feel? Pissed off, angry, sad. Frustrated, okay, there is some F word coming up, I will not say it. Uh, and that is a story which I just recently read. And we tend to get a lot of those news, that something is wrong, something is bad, and so on. Highlighting issues like this is very important. But if, if this is all we get, then we add up to just lowering down the trust. Because all we get this. Now, I'll tell you this story. So I will tell you now that there is actually a restaurant which developed a model which deals with it. So they have, the whole team sat down and they have color coded different behaviors. There's yellow, orange and green. And that basically means, and there are different actions to it. So you see, th those are like, so what happened is right now all the waitresses in this restaurant, they have a code and they know what to do. So let's say you are making bad jokes to me. Okay, I want to enjoy, I'm serving you food, you're making big jokes, I can go here to, to Deborah and say like uh, yellow. That means that immediately waiter is changed, a new person shows up, you know. Orange means manager has to come and you do, do a small shake up like, you know, Jakub, just cool down, cool down or we will have to throw you out. Red is like, get out of the restaurant. And that actually started to work because they've really lowered down the numbers of red warnings. Now what's really powerful in this, it's a working solution which has proven impact and it allows us to really reframe the conversation. We switch from like, oh God, we have to do something about um, you know, sexual harassment in the restaurants versus this is a model. We may not like it, we may like it, we may try to adopt it differently and so on and so on and so on. And this is called solutions journalism. Are you trying to tell me something? Are you just, no? Okay. So, who is familiar with solutions journalism? I hope you are listening to me and that's just, uh, no one knows it rather than you're not listening to me. Okay. So, solutions journalism is a concept which I really encourage you to, um, um, like, get really into. It has four, uh, four very simple rules. There's whole solutions journalism network which develops it. It covers a response to a problem and how it happened, you know. It also covers working, provides evidence of impact. So basically, we are not talking about theories here. We are talking about we are trying to find a problem and journalists try to adapt the research methodology to find people who actually work on those solutions. Sorry. We also try to question those limitations and so on and so on. So if you would have a graph of data and here is 2% crime rate in one district of uh, Taipei, and then you have other districts and goes up, and then you have 99% crime rate. Solutions journalism is about covering, let's say, also positive deviance. So not saying this district is basically a deadly zone. You go to that 2% and you start to think, okay, what the hell is happening here that the crime rate is so low? And that's how you, for example, find a solution story. Okay, end game. What was my end game? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so just to summarize this all, I want to show you basically an example of a story which was released in Polish um, last week by us, which basically tries to combine all of this. So first of all, we, as part of the discussions with the community, we have come to, like, we've noticed that there are people who are, um, in some Polish cities, are worried about increasing tourism and what is doing to the city, gentrification, pri pri price ranges, and so on and so on and so on. So we did a story which have, like, where we covered many European cities which also fight with this issue for quite a while and you know, but you probably, let's say, know Barcelona. Barcelona has um, put a lot of, there's a hotel, like you, you cannot put any more hotels in the center and so on. There's a lot of working solutions about it. So first of all, we did this story which was cross-border. Uh, our reporters are always on the ground and they went to all those places where they talked to the people, they were trying to find working solutions 
to solve the, to solve that issue, how, what is done, what, what doesn't work. We also covered it from many angles in terms of various cities, various contexts, and so on and so on. And in the end, we try to release it, of course, in this nice, cool, super interactive form. But it's only a mean to us. We are just, like Marcel was saying, nerds. And we do this, we like to play with the form and so on. But in order to also reach more people, we started to release those stories also as stories. So we try to go really where people are. And that's actually, this is where we also talk to the people. So we released this story on Instagram and Facebook stories. It was actually like custom made just for this format where people engage with us and so on and so on. So this is like how we try to go really to the people, be with them and engage them so they would come back with us. And finally, what was going to happen, we are not trying to finish with just publishing, you know? Because all of this, we are trying to have, we will have now uh, meeti me meetings, we will uh, curate discussions in two of the, two, two of the cities which uh, have those issues. So basically, that story is, let's say, we are not, this is not the end game, that story. That story is, I would say, the beginning of a bigger discussion, but we have laid down, we try to lay down a different um, foundation for it rather than like, no more tourists, you know, ban them and so on. Uh, because that all combined, I hope, I hope, will give us impact. And that's something what we really want. And this is what I wanted to uh, leave you with. Thank you very much.